We're, we're glad to have all of you here. And I just might note, uh, Madam President, that we have the Hinton contingent right down here. The, I've never had anyone come in uh, to, uh, to cheer. Uh, you know, I'm from Vernal, Utah, a very small town, and uh, they were glad to get rid of me, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm grateful about that. So uh, I am um, very pleased to welcome all of you here today. Um, this is a wonderful time for us uh, at our university because of the fact that you're all here and joining us, and it's uh, also wonderful to see so many people passionate about children. Um, and the two people that we have with us today are truly passionate about children. Uh, of course, West Virginia University is the state's land-grant uh, university. Um, and as such, we exist to improve people's lives. That is our calling. Uh, and uh, that is our responsibility. And if that is uh, the case, then the, then the health of our children is absolutely paramount. Um, I'm grateful to the Rockefeller School of... Uh, policy and politics, um, my senator, for bringing together so many experts to talk about our state's progress in providing um, affordable care to children, about how we can extend that progress and make our success a model for other states. The presence of so many leading policymakers uh, here um, speaks to the importance of uh, this issue. Among many special guests, I'm pleased, of course, to welcome Pat Getty, um, we want to make certain that Pat uh, and Kim know that we appreciate the great work of the, uh, of the foundation. Uh, the Benenden Foundation has been our partner forever. Give them a round of applause, would you please? <laughs> Sharon Cart from West Virginians for Affordable Health Care and many elected officials, we've been, they have been introduced, uh, but I want to thank them. I want to thank our elected officials for being here. This is an important uh, discussion that will continue uh, after this conference. Um, and thank you for taking a, taking a stand for children. When it comes to making children's health a priority, no one sets a better example than our two keynote speakers. In 1964, a young man from New York City arrived in tiny Emmons, West Virginia, as a VISTA volunteer. He descended from one of America's wealthiest families, but his experiences living and working among poverty-stricken minors would change his course forever. In the same era, Sylvia Matthews Burwell was born in Hinton, where she would learn about community service and develop a passion for helping others. So both of these people would transform the lessons they learned in small West Virginia towns into tangible improvements in people's health. It is a great honor for me to have both of these wonderful people with us today. Yes, Sylvia Matthews Burwell, now president of American University, um, I don't know how she made that terrible mistake, but she did. Um, <laughs> she previously promoted um, the health and well-being of every American as the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services. In that role, she worked to increase people's access to the building blocks of, of a healthy and productive society. Before serving in that post, I might note, um, Sylvia was director of the Office of Management and Budget, Budget where she worked with Congress to establish an orderly budget um, an appropriation process that brought needy, uh, needed stability to the economy and middle class families. In a career, in her career, which has been devoted entirely to public service and philanthropy, she has also held high ranking positions in the Clinton administration and with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. As president of the Walmart Foundation, she led efforts to fight hunger uh, in America and empower women around the world. President Burwell's presence here today is made possible through the Ware Family Foundation, which funds the Ware Distinguished Lectureship. And as a commencement speaker on our campus, she attributed her success to the values she learned as a child, saying, and I quote from her, I learned about community in Hinton, and I learned about serving others. I learned that I have a passion for trying to help my friends and neighbors the way they help me. And I say that to the ladies in front, and I built my career around that passion. The same passion has animated Jay Rockefeller's lifetime of uh, service to West Virginia. For generations, the Rockefeller name has been synonymous with generosity and leadership and commitment to advancing our knowledge of the world. Jay Rockefeller has more than lived up to his family's legacy, serving West Virginia in the House of Delegates as Secretary of State, as a two-term governor, and for three decades, 
as United States Senator and a leading champion for health care reform. His work in the Senate helped to reduce the number of uninsured families to improve seniors and veterans' health care and to maintain the health benefits promised to retired minors and still workers. In 1997, he authored legislation that created the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, to serve families who are above the income level um, for Medicaid but who cannot afford private insurance. The program served nearly 50,000 West Virginia children and almost 9 million children nationally this year. His many other priorities as a center included strengthening math and science education, expanding rural broadband access, and advancing scientific research. Throughout his career, his visionary leadership has benefited our state, our nation, and of course, uh, our university is proud to serve as the home to the John D. Rockefeller IV School of, of Policy and Politics. And we are proud to have both uh, Jay Rockefeller and Sylvia Burwell here today. They will each speak to you and then lead a joint discussion on children's health policy. So please join me in welcoming Sylvia Matthews Burwell and Jay Rockefeller. And I believe, Sylvia, you're going to, you're going to do the first, uh, uh, the first uh, opportunity to speak. Give them a round of applause, would you please? Thank you very much, President Gee. It's always wonderful to return to Morgantown and the university here. I want to thank the Benedum Foundation for their support of this summit and the West Virginia University John D. Rockefeller IV School of Policy and Politics, the Health Sciences Center, the Libraries, and the Ware Family Foundation. But most of all, I actually want to thank all of you all who are part of this audience here today. We're joined by advocates and researchers. Many of you have dedicated your entire career and often life well beyond the office to the children of West Virginia. There are so many West Virginians that have worked so hard to make a difference on these issues like Sharon Cart, Renata Poor, Mary Pearl Compton, all of you in this room and thousands more across our great state. And there is nothing more impactful and nothing more important than our work for children. I'm honored to join you all. I'm especially honored to join our former governor and United States Senator Jay Rockefeller. You all probably won't be surprised to know that this, not, this is not the first time that I've stood with Jay Rockefeller. In fact, I worked on his first campaign for governor in 1972. It was a hard-fought election, but despite our best efforts, we lost. I can't help but shoulder some of the blame. I was a relative newcomer to the campaign trail, and we always knew it would be a tough race, and my math homework kept me from knocking on a few doors. <laughs> I was seven. Uh, I still have my little J pin from that campaign. A few little years later, though, I would have the chance to meet Jay Rockefeller again this time on the steps of the Memorial Building in Hinton as he was running again. And at this point, we were armed with our tape recorders. For those of you in the audience who are not old enough to remember, <laughs> it's kind of like an iPhone, only much harder to use and not nearly as good. And if you carried one around a lot, people thought you were weird. <laughs> but we had a reason. Uh, we were the dogged reporters of the Central News and World Report, our sixth grade newspaper. <laughs> Two of my fellow reporters are here today, Terry Giles and Christy Scott. They've joined us again today. I'd like to think that it was actually the publicity from that interview <laughs> that really put him over the top in that campaign. <laughs> and I also want to just point out that those sixth graders actually voted in their first elections for your next Senate race in terms of continuing that effort to put you over the top. So four decades after that interview, I'm here for several reasons. First, I'll pretty much go anywhere Jay Rockefeller asked me to go. <laughs> Second, our nation's health tomorrow depends on the health of our children today. And finally, I'm here because Jay Rockefeller taught me 
that on those memorial building steps, you always need to stay connected to the people you serve. That's how he governed as a governor and as a senator. And that's how he knows that today's topic is so important to the people of West Virginia. If there's anything I've learned in my years in government, it's that you always have to focus on the connection to the people you serve, because they can change everything. Take the Affordable Care Act. Here in West Virginia, when Medicaid expansion and the health insurance marketplace first opened for business, an estimated 28.8% of non-elderly adult West Virginians were uninsured. You all know them. They're our friends, they're our neighbors, they're people we go to church with. Between 2013 and 2016, West Virginia saw that rate fall by two-thirds, the largest drop in the nation. More than 180,000 West Virginians gained coverage through Medicaid expansion, and more than 9 in 10 non-elderly adults now have insurance in our state. Coverage rates for kids are up too. In 2013, there were an estimated 20,000 West Virginia children who had no health insurance. By 2015, that had been nearly cut in half to 11,000, and West Virginia went from the 11th to the 7th state in terms of the fewest uninsured children. With more people insured, more families are getting the health care that they need. Researchers are finding that Medicaid expansion leads to more people getting checkups, preventative care, regular care for chronic conditions, and fewer people are delaying that needed care or leaving prescriptions unfilled due to cost. And even as we expanded coverage, growth in per enrollee health care costs has begun to slow. After the ACA was passed in West Virginia, the average family with insurance through a job saw their premium growth slow. And of course, the law barred discrimination based on pre-existing conditions. Young adults could stay on their parents' plan through until they turned 26. And it eliminated lifetime and annual limits on coverage, which had been devastating to families caring for someone with a disability or a chronic condition. And that's not to say that there aren't very large challenges in our healthcare system. Tens of thousands of West Virginians, including thousands of children, still don't have health insurance. And sometimes because they don't know about the coverage, they don't know about CHIP, they don't know about Medicaid, or they don't know about subsidies that they could receive in the marketplace. And even with the slowdown in costs since the ACA was passed, premiums and deductibles are rising too fast for many families who are trying to make ends meet. And there's lots more to do to make sure that coverage consistently results in high quality care, including appropriate treatment for people struggling with opioid addiction, and substance use disorders. But we also can't turn our backs on the progress that we have made. And before last November, the idea of repeal and rolling back the coverage gains that we'd made was mostly rhetoric. But when the election delivered Republican control of all three branches of government, it seemed nearly certain that those efforts to repeal the ACA would succeed. There were some who even predicted a repeal bill would pass the Congress by February. But as July ended, six months after the inauguration, the proposals to repeal the Affordable Care Act had not been passed. And why? Because those whose lives had been changed for better pushed back against it. Because as Jay Rockefeller always knew, the connection between elected representatives and the people they represent can change the legislative calculus. Groups in communities and states across the nation, and especially here in this state, thanks to many of you in this room, amplified the people's voice and helped people tell their own individual stories. People showed up and made sure to tell their own stories, and stories that made a real difference in protecting the gains that had been made. The proposed repeal bills would have been devastating to West Virginia, precisely because West Virginia had made so much progress. More states need to and should learn from the success here, starting with the work in CHIP and the Medicaid program. Here in West Virginia, more than half of all children are covered by Medicaid. Numerous studies 
show that the children on Medicaid and our CHIP populations, when compared to uninsured children, are more likely to continue their education, have higher wages, contribute more in taxes, and ultimately live longer. And children are more likely to get coverage if their parents are covered. And that's a very important reason to keep the progress that we've made. States and federal government should also work together to strengthen the marketplaces to ensure that they're stable and that health plans can compete on price and quality so those adults can get covered. And the federal government should protect the highly successful Children's Health Insurance Program, which we celebrate today, the funding of which will run out this fall. CHIP has always enjoyed strong bipartisan support, and I'm hopeful that that tradition will continue this year. These are all, there are always states and federal government, they all have ways that they can help improve the health coverage of children. We also need to improve actual health care delivery. And as the old saying goes, there are mountains beyond mountains, indicating when you work on one problem, you've got to continue looking because you need to go to the next thing. And we've been on a journey to expand coverage. And at the same time, innovators and policymakers across the country have been on a journey to make health care better at a lower cost. And this work generally has a wonky name called delivery system reform, but it's based on three pretty simple principles. The first is that we should pay healthcare providers based on how well they keep people healthy. Doctors and hospitals should be rewarded based on the value of the care that they provide, not the volume of their services. Second, we should change the way that we deliver care. That is, more integrated care, where one doctor talks to another doctor or another provider, so your care becomes integrated and they're working as a team. And we should focus more on prevention. And finally, we should open up data so patients can easily access their own health information and so physicians and other healthcare providers can see the full picture of a patient's health. Over the past years, we've made progress. Accountable care organizations or groups of physicians that commit to the health of a group of patients have provided high quality care while saving Medicare more than $1.29 billion since 2012. And there are programs that pay for a patient's condition instead of what step was taken. Bundled payments now pay physicians for an entire episode of care rather than for each individual piece of care. Physicians who improve care at lower costs get to share in some of the savings. Our entire health system is moving slowly, but inevitably, toward a system that rewards value, empowers patients, and keeps folks healthy at lower cost. That's a gift that our generation will hopefully give to the next. Not only the care they need today, but a better health care system. One that doesn't burden them with excessive costs, that aims to keep them healthy throughout their lives. In 1963, a young president, one who spent a number of days in the campaign trail here in West Virginia, came to the university where I serve today. President Kennedy told the audience gathered at American University, quote, in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future and we are all mortal. That's what brings us all here today. We all cherish our children's future, and that means we have to protect it, we have to invest in it, and sometimes we have to fight for it. And now, I wanna turn it over to someone who has fought for many, many years. Uh, she's pretty good, isn't she? <laughs> she's a force of nature. And a lot of the good that's come about in healthcare 
including Chip, has very much to do with Sylvia Burwell, who I always knew as Sylvia Matthews. When I was, we were had the why would why would we remember that interview <laughs> on the steps of the library so many years ago? It was probably was it your first interview of a yeah. of a Paul? Yeah. yeah, probably an unfortunate experience. <laughs> I. Um, Gordon Gee, are you still here? Yeah. Well, you're a good man, too. <laughs> and I thank you, because it was sort of your idea to start this school with my name on it. And, um, and you're just generally a really good, smart, aggressive, West Virginia first person. And you always have been. You always have been that way. David Hardesty and I have worked together for most of our adult lives. Uh, when I was governor, he was my treasurer, didn't steal any money, <laughs> and uh, was a dis great and distinguished head of this uh, university. So, and so many others. Uh, Sharon, we'll have more to say about you, but you don't know yet. I want to thank, I want to thank um, members of my health staff who have gone on, one of them close to hypothermia extinction over there in the cold, <laughs> Sarah Dash. And she heads up an organization called the Alliance for Health Policy. It used to be called the Alliance for Health Reform, but the word reform got tricky in Washington. So we backed off a little bit. And it's the same thing. Nobody has any idea how important that group was Senator Jack Danforth, any of you heard of his name? And I started 20 years ago. Um, and it, the whole purpose of it is knowledge. It's so easy in healthcare, which I swear to you has to be one of the most difficult, maybe the most difficult public policy problem that ever existed. I mean, intelligence, warfare, I guess, but you know, in the intricacies of knowledge, if you don't know knowledge about healthcare, you don't know the difference between this and that, and the gradations and the nuances, then, you're, then you become a partisan. Because you, you make life simple for yourself simply by taking one angry position over here, another angry position over there, and you stop thinking. And you stop thinking because your mind is not called to account for itself, and are you speaking knowledgeably? What Sarah Dash's organization does uh, for the last 20 years, it's, it took we didn't even allow senators or congressmen into the, into the hearings at first. But they would gather, there'd be about usually 300 staff from the Congress, both houses. And um, then we'd have speakers on interesting and important subjects. And they'd always be two on the left and two on the right, and they would go at each other. And then they would stop, and then Danforth and I would just take questions on paper and ask them to for the, these respondents to answer. And what happened was we did, came up with a brilliant thing. We had box lunches, but they were box lunches with really good brownies. <laughs> so our attendance was, was just constant. I mean, we just had these things several times a month. You still do. I get more, you know, emails about your meetings, most of which you're presiding over. It's just constant, the knowledge about healthcare. What does it mean? Um, and and what, are the, <laughs> what are the arguments? So anyway, um, I'm not meant to be talking about that. I'm meant to be talking about what it w was that made me decide that I really cared about children in West Virginia. And I had a sort of a similar experience um, to others. Uh, there's a fellow, is there a fellow named Craig Robinson here? Yeah, there you are back there. Craig Robinson and I both come from a most unpopular state. It's called New York. <laughs> We're both carpetbaggers. So why are we here all these years later? We both became VISTA volunteers. I came here as a social worker in 1964. Went to a little community in the southern part of Kanawha County with a swing br swinging bridge which linked it to Boone. And although they were all interrelated, they were constantly a warfare. Because if you were from Boone, you were mad at Kanawha because they thought you were looking down on, on the Boone County people, which they were for the most part. 
So it was a it was classic political message written wrong and written large uh, in the ordinary lives of people. So I, I went out there every day, and I had no idea why they accepted me. Um, I, I just went, I was out there to do good. I didn't know what kind of good. I'd spent uh, three years in Japan right after the war, uh, learning their language, learning all the problems they've been through with the Philippines, with the Peace Corps, and, and, uh, and the State Department, uh, Indonesia. So I'd been exposed to a lot of poverty and problems and people in distress. Uh, but there was something about West Virginia which made me not be able to leave. I mean, I'm, I, had, I had a game plan. I wanted to be Secretary of State or the world's leading expert on China and Japan. But it, it wasn't going to happen because I came here as a social worker and I went to Emmons. And they simply taught me what real people are like. Honest, hardworking, put upon people with no health care, no roads, no infrastructure, no really good education, no health facilities within sight. Um, people got sick and they just did the best they could. We had a, I remember we had a, um, a pap smear program and uh, we got a bus and the pap smear program would tell a woman if she was getting close to having cancer or cervical cancer, she had it. And one of my first lessons was that we got this bus out to visit with a doctor and started going to Southern County, West Virginia counties. Nobody showed up. Nobody showed up for a very good reason. People were not necessarily enthusiastic about the chance that even with all the, the misery and difficulties of their sicknesses and lives and the poverty they were living in, why go to a doctor who would tell you you had cancer? You just don't do that. So it just it short-circuited the whole instinct to engage with healthcare. And that was a very powerful lesson to me because I grew up when the doctor came to my house, <laughs> in my parents' house, and it was rather different that way. Um, I remember when I, I, I get along very well with children. And um, one of my first experiences in, in, in Emmons was to know that not one single one of those children had ever been to a dentist. And I thought that to be a, a problem to be solved. And so we got a couple cheap loads of, of people from Emmons, West Virginia, children. Um, young, teenage, et cetera. And we went to the Tiskawa Elementary School, which had something called a free dental clinic. And I was assuming that these kids were gonna get their teeth cleaned and polished and all this stuff, no. The dentist took a look at them, determined very clearly and very easily that um, they were really past redemption in terms of tooth health care. And it was too late to bring them back. You'd pass that point where you could reclaim the teeth or to, you know, to take the teeth out or whatever it was that you had to do. They were past that point. So I felt good that we made the trip to the dentist. I felt terrible when the dentist told me it was, a, it was futile on my part and too late. Nice try, good instinct, but no result. Boy, that, that hit. And that was a message really for everything. Um, life is stacked against you. Uh, the, this, this is very much a, a, a class conscious state, as most states are. Uh, the, between the cities and the rural areas, there's a lot of difference, a lot of uh, lack of intensity in one part and, and intensity not geared towards people in rural areas. And it's, it's something that we've suffered from and other states suffer from, um, and, and that's very sad. The, my work in healthcare when I was governor um, and in the Senate um, was basically to try to get more of it and to learn about it and to be bipartisan about it. 
I was determined just by my human nature, uh, my mother's genes or something, just to be optimistic and that you never quit, that you could be presented by a total Berlin Wall and it'll come down at some point. Either Ronald Reagan will do it for you or our own work will, will do it for us. And that's what healthcare is about. It's also an, an issue of justice. Um, if, if you don't bring health care and a sense of hope uh, to people in communities, large or small, then you've done absolutely nothing and you've empowered them not at all. You can't just provide a service and assume it's going to be taken up. It has to be a service which is wanted. And as Sylvia was pointing out, I too thought that the Affordable Care Act was, was going to be repealed. I just thought that. And I, was, and I was dead wrong, and I was predictably dead wrong. It, it was interesting, and Sylvia, you'll remember this. When we first did health care under the Clintons, health care was, was done top down. In other words, it was a, the Clinton administration, and I was part of the group that was trying to help, designed a health care plan, and then they delivered it unto the Congress, which was furious because you don't do that to the Congress. And you know, my colleague at that time, Senator Byrd, was absolutely furious. How dare they you know, dump on Pat Moynihan's finance committee desk the plan and then testify smoothly with Hillary Clinton knowing every single um, hospital and rural, rural health station in every single state that she was, uh, whose senators she was talking to. But it was, a, it was an interesting lesson. You don't do something from the top down in this country and expect to have it really work. Now, the next al alternative came along with Obama, not necessarily related to Obama, but just in the, in the ebb and flow of, of events. We decided to do it ourselves. It was very messy. It was on television, not fun to watch, very bad for any politician's reputation. But we, we ground it out. We ground it out. And why could we do that? For two reasons. One is, it wasn't quite as partisan then as it is now. But I think more importantly, it was the staff. Our healthcare staff, uh, John Chapey, who was a Republican since uh, deceased uh, from Rhode Island, um, and, and um, I don't know, just, you know, John Dingle and myself, et cetera, our staff, they, they became friends. Senators don't have time to make friends. They used to be able to, but you just don't go out to dinner anymore with friends. It's, it's everything is, is fundraising. So the, the role of the senator is actually less direct than it used to be. Um, and who makes up the difference? The staff. And you get healthcare policy staff, and I'm looking at four of the best over there. Ellen, nobody's mentioned you today, but we all love you. Harry Reid, Ellen went to work for Harry Reid after she worked for me. My wife doesn't like Harry Reid. I love Harry Reid. And because, well, he's very blunt. And if you say something nice to him, he turns around and walks away. I mean, that's just the way he is. He just hangs up in a conversation when he's tired of listening. But the deal was he would not make an important telephone call unless Ellen Doneski was on that phone call. In other words, the, the trust, the, the leaning of the Senate and the House on their staff, particularly the staff who'd been there for quite some time and staff get to know each other. The Laura Rubiner situation, that was John Chapey's staff person. And Mariella Payne and Ellen Doneski and all kinds of people for me, they're, they're, they're very close friends. They did have time to hang out during the midnight hours. But they became friends, and they influenced us because they knew more than we did, because we had all of these subjects coming at us. They were focused. They were focused. So when we came to the, for example, the, the Children's Commission, which lasted, it was a two-year commission, but we made it last for four years because it was necessary just to do that. And I mean, they, we had some of the most conservative House members, some of the most conservative people in the country on that, and, and some liberal people too. Why was it? that with a Children's Commission, which went into all problems that children faced, including, and most particularly, healthcare, why was it that we came out with a 32 to nothing vote 
in favor. Not a single negative vote. Some of you will remember the name Wade Horn. We remember the word Wade Horn because Wade Horn really didn't want to vote for that thing because he was very strong, committed, uh, principled Republican. He just didn't want to do it. He had to do it because all of his colleagues were doing it and there was no reason why he shouldn't, except if it were politics. But somehow the, the spirit of bipartisanship, again staff, but again, we always had our meetings where the press couldn't find us. That's very important. But the, the, we developed this camaraderie and, um, and 32 to nothing, it passed 32 to nothing. I mean, it's just unheard of today, isn't it? But it happened. And the seeds of that happening again are still with us. So lesson one, don't do something from the top down. Don't hand a solution to the Congress. Let the Congress grind it out, ugly and unattractive though it may be. Secondly, um, really trust your staff uh, because they have knowledge and, they, and their enthusiasm causes you to jump in and, and you know, clean up on knowledge as best as you possibly can. And um, I don't know, the, the, it's a very bad time right now. Uh, and we're still trying to find, Sylvia is the ultimate finder outer of these things, but you know, the, I, I was driving most of yesterday to get here, and the, uh, the president evidently is going along with the Democrats on something, and then I was listening to MSNBC last night because I don't generally listen to Fox, I should but learn to do more, but um, they mentioned a tax credit, and I thought I heard the word children. I either thought I heard it or I did hear it. I wanted to hear it, so maybe I didn't hear it. But that has to be, that expires on September 17th, of obviously this month and we need it for another five years. And we're gonna get it, we're gonna get it, because when things come down to something which is popular, which has total bipartisan support, it will survive. And why does it have bipartisan support? Because people are caring. They're not in it for themselves, they're in it because of the public service, because you're helping people. It's everything that's, that you want to see in, um, in social workers and nurses and physicians and all the rest of it. And there's, there's so much can be done. Uh, I, I remember once we were the, the, in the, on the Veterans Committee, uh, the pharmaceutical costs to veterans were just awful. So we came up at, two, at three o'clock in the morning somewhere in the, in the Capitol building with a solution. And that was that all veterans hospitals all over the country, something like 500, large and small, would submit their bills Together, they would link up to be one unit. What happened? The cost of prescription drugs went down by 50% by the next year because the government had made the decision to say, we can put pressure on you too. We did, and it worked. And as Sylvia's pointed out, actually, um, premium increases are, are a lot slower than people think. Every time they hear about a bad premium, premium increase, it's, they assume it's, it's, it's happening to them. Often it's because the insurance company, at the beginning particularly, weren't making money, and so they were giving, having very low premiums, and then they couldn't exist that way. And I'm no big fan of the health insurance industry, but we need them, and so that now they, they play better ball, but they have to be disciplined and watched over very carefully. So um, what is my point? My point is that this is a time where it's fashionable to be anti-government, anti-political, anti-representative form of government. It's actually a very bad time to feel badly about that and a very good time to feel very good about that. Um, there may not be blatant hope running around in this country, but there is in all of us, in all of you who dedicate your lives to healthcare, to people, to doing good for the sake of doing good, no matter what it costs to you. Thank you. So if you want to take a few questions or have conversation at this point, we'll open that up to both of you. No, I just want to make it very clear. 
that Sylvia Matthews Burwell, who interviewed me when she was in the sixth grade, and I have no idea what the article said. It was a positive, that's good. Was meant to be on the West Coast today with Mark Zuckerberg, who heads up a relatively large startup company, right? <laughs> Has about four or five billion customers. And, um, and she actually sort of made him change his schedule so she could change her schedule and come and talk to you. We take some questions. Yeah, I think it's a good Happy idea. Happy to. Yes. Hi, thank you for sharing. Um, I guess, okay, I'll stand up. <laughs> My question is, how did you stay connected with the people you served after you achieved these, these roles where you were having so much information coming at you? How did you remain connected? You mean to healthcare information or to the community the people, that I was? The, the community. People. Mm -hmm. uh, because they had become family. You know, um, it was rather unusual to have this sort of carpetbagger from New York City with a very, very vile last name. Um, Gordon Gee celebrated it, but a lot of people don't. And, and um, uh, have them come and then say, I'm here to help. You know, who's going to believe that? Well, it turns out that you can be there to help and that you keep coming back day after day after day and you start setting up, well, we had a, a baseball team. And how do you know, get people to talk to each other? We, we had community meetings sometimes, Sylvia. Actually, some of the men, and this goes back to dental problems also, that didn't have teeth, they would be at the meeting facing away from the meeting, facing away from the meeting as we were discussing community progress to be understood, totally natural. But we had a baseball team, and over the period of two years, our record was zero wins and 24 losses. Made no difference. It made no difference. The fact is that we played the game, they ventured, they ran around bases, they didn't win, but it's all part of how do you pull together? How do you stitch yourself together? How do you get the Kanawha County side and the Boone County side to talk to each other with only a, a swinging footbridge to, uh, to connect you. Well, it can be done. They're all related. They just forget that. And you're, my job is, as a community organizer, as social worker, is to help them remember that by building up programs in that community. Uh, it's probably the happiest period of my life. I think you, uh, your question indicates what is a challenge when you get into the jobs and you know, you're you're doing the job and, and doing the work each day that's demanded if you're a senator or a governor or in the uh, roles that I've had. But I think the answer is that you have to make it a priority and you have to be intentional about it because you'll lose it if not. You have to make it a priority. And uh, you know, we, uh, my husband and I, we do our best to try and get home every other month. Um, for me, home is West Virginia. And so that's one way you do it. I still actually get the Hinton News, uh, the newspaper from my town, and you know, that connects you to the reality that people are seeing and feeling. But to answer your question of how you stay proximate to the real issues, the real concerns, it takes effort and you have to be intentional. And whether that's, you know, President Obama did it by, he had letters every day. You know, he actually had people give him a selection of the letters he was actually receiving from people. And that was part of the way that he would keep in touch and understand what people were really, really thinking. So it's about how you travel, how you read, where you go, who you see when you go places. But it has to be very intentional because the roles have many different pieces and parts. But for all of the kinds of roles we're talking about, it's staying close. I mean, for me now, it's walking the campus. That's how I know what's happening. You walk the campus and you run into the students and you see, you go, I've had lunch in our cafeteria. You see what's happening when you do it. So it's being intentional. So 
Senator, I just want, you mentioned the veterans um, issues, and I just wanted to thank you again for your work with veterans issues as a veteran myself, and um, it's been phenomenal, your support of us over the years. So I want to thank you for that. Um, I know we're here to... I'm sorry, say again. Why don't you run for Congress? Oh, dear oh. Lord. <laughs> I could not pass the, I couldn't pass the skeleton test, I'm sure. It's way too many. I'm one of nine. There's one of everything in my family. And I'm probably at least five of them. Um, my question is, and you've talked about staying connected with people, um, in terms of children's health care issues, you know, I'm one of nine, very poor family. I was not native West Virginian, but from another state that's right next door. And uh, I'm a Buckeye, President Gee. <laughs> yes. Um, and I mean, we didn't have access to care when I was younger. And we thought going to the dentist was Murder Mouth Mitchell because he only pulled our teeth. We were that to that point. And I spent many years at the OSU Dental Clinic as a younger child and had terrible fear of dentists as a result. But getting back to children's health care issues, how do we? Um, rally the people who are in Washington, whichever direction we're facing, so that we can stop some of this crap that's going on, so people can be more bipartisan and work together. How do we change that conversation? Because right now, I mean, somebody mentioned being on the defensive and the conversation's so toxic. How do you, like, call a time out and, you know, reverse skate? Because it's not working. Well, it's happening now. I think that uh, everyone has a role in making that change that we need to make in terms of getting people to work together to do the compromise. And I think even in times like this, I am optimistic and believe we can do it. When I first arrived at the Office of Management and Budget, I came and was confirmed, and the first day in the office, it was the one of the days where, because of the sequester, we had everybody not there. And so, you know, but I believed we could get a deal, and we did. You know, there was a deal, it was called Ryan Murray. And those two very unlikely people, Paul Ryan and Patty Murray, uh, came together and did it, and brought the nation to a place where we had a two-year deal. That deal was followed by people called Mikulski Rogers, two of our neighboring states, Barbara Mikulski from Maryland, and Hal Rogers from Kentucky very different individuals, but they put together the first time since 1987 that we had all of the appropriations bills done at once. That was the first time. And so there are things and you see that we can make it happen. And right now, it right now today, actually as we're speaking, Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander in this very space of healthcare have taken up the mantle and there is a hearing going on right now with bipartisan governors. John Hickenlooper, Democrat from Colorado, Bill Haslam, very conservative Tennessee Republican governor, Charlie Baker from Massachusetts, another Republican, the governor on Montana, another Democrat, all testifying together. Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander have brought folks together. They have put together, John Kasich and Hickenlooper have a plan like how we can go forward and make progress. It is possible. It is the role of those we elect, those governors and those members, to find that common ground to work in that way. It is the role of our citizenry. It is the role of everyone else to make sure that we support that, that we praise that, that we give them the room. Because when common ground is found and negotiations are done, there are compromises. I negotiated with Mike Pence Medicaid expansion in Indiana. And I'm here to tell you, and if he were sitting right here, he'd say, I didn't get everything I wanted. And I will say, I didn't get everything I wanted. But what we did agree was, what we were getting was gonna help the people of Indiana move forward. And so when that happens, people saying, that is well done, that is what we want, that is what we demand as citizens of our country. So I think there's a role for those who are serving, but there's also a broader role, uh, a broader role of us not piling on to the type of anger uh, and fight that we see and that encouragement of seeking common ground. I so totally agree. And you know, so, so much of it is just artificial, the anger and the hatred. 
the partisanship. It doesn't have any basis in reality. We're all there elected to do something. And if we decide that we want to be negative, well, you can always do that. Television helps you do that. The money in elections helps you do that. And the, the trend sometimes helps you to do that. But the trend can also go the other way, which is what Sylvia is talking about, that there is a, a glory in working together. And why does that, is it glorious? Because you are getting a partner, a Republican and a Democrat, and therefore expanded, accomplishing something, doing something that could not be accomplished in the partisan atmosphere, but could be accomplished if, as Sylvia said, you don't get everything you want, but neither does he or she. It works, it works, and it's, it's underneath every member of the Congress today, if they would only see it, or if we would allow them to exercise it. And that's also a problem with special interest groups, too. I mean, it's very hard to do health care with the insurance industry bearing down on top of you, but it's not impossible, right? Because we, we the medical loss ratio thing, we put, we put the clamps on uh, the health insurance companies that they could only make, if they were large, they could only make, uh, uh, well, I think 10% that they could spend on administration and marble buildings and all the rest of it. All the rest had to go to health care. And if they were smaller, it would be uh, 15%. They could keep 15%. Everything else had to go to health care. That is the law. My name is Barbara Fleischer, and I'm a member of the House of Delegates, and I'm very glad that I have um, two of my colleagues here, Joe Statler and Amy Summers, because we do work well together. But yesterday, I participated in a panel discussion about displaced and transient children. And most of what we ended up talking about was all the children who are being taken out of their homes because of the opioid crisis. And it ended up feeling very overwhelming and very discouraging. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe point us in a, direct, a hopeful direction. I mean, it is so exciting that we're here on the 20th year of CHIP and that we can be proud that we have um, met that milestone, but it just feels like everything could disappear if, um, and, and the, the long-term implications of, of these children being taken out of the home and going into foster care and we don't know what happens with them after they're 18 and that their parents, you know, are they going to be, I mean, it just feels like our state and most states are facing an enormous cliff and, um, I didn't feel very hopeful after that conversation yesterday, but I wondered if you could point us in a hopeful direction since you have faced similar challenges that were really hard and, and lived to talk about the victories. Um, I think the answer to that is that you don't ever get to use the excuse that you're not hopeful, that you never say something can't happen. You can say a situation is bad, and opioids, all of that, you know, imported from other, other countries, and we get mad at those countries, but it's we who are creating the demand for them to produce this stuff, and it's, it's our own fault. Can we work our way through that? I think we will. I think we will. I think it'll take time. It takes good parenting. That takes a decent income, and being able to work as a family unit. Um, no mother or no father wants their children to become, uh, you know, addicts. It's terrible when you see it on television, but I'm always very glad when I do see it on television because it is so terrible and it's so harmful, it's so hurtful. And so what is the answer to that? There's no one, two, three, four, five list. It's called parenting, love, keeping hopeful. People are basically good. So, I will probably do a little of the one, two, three, four, five list um, because I, you know, part of going home and staying close is, you know, you see the problem and you see it up close and you see it for families and you see how this is devastating, you know, our state. You see it with employers and so, and not just our state, Kentucky, you know, this is not limited to West Virginia, but certainly our situation is so acute. And I will say, having spent 
time on this problem. It was one of my priorities as the Secretary of Health and Human Services because of the acute nature that I was familiar with. Um, there are a couple things. This is one that isn't like there's no diet pill, there's no snap your fingers. This is, I think, to the Senator's point, it's going to take um, a culture and that part of it, and it's going to take some particular steps. And so it is going to have to be a priority at the local, state, and federal level. It has to be a priority, and a priority means that resources, both people's time and money, have to go at the problem. And they have to go at the problem in a number of different ways. First, we have to go towards prevention. And prevention is the full range of changing prescribing behaviors, which is essential in terms of, uh, you know, I have a personal point of view that I can, I guess, now express, which is I believe that it should be mandatory in terms of the training. Um, th there's everything around prescribing, and, you know, there were changes that were made, and Christy is a physical therapist here told me. People were making decisions because of some of the ways that the federal government um, measured when you were asked as a patient if you felt pain. And even though it didn't count in terms of how much you were paid, it was in a provider's head. And so changing all of those things around providing, uh, from pre preventing, and that means providing the opioids. So that's a whole category we need to do. And then the other category we need to do is for those that are now addicted, making sure that there's appropriate treatment, and that is one of the most acute problems. We need medication-assisted treatment. And that means that there are drugs that can help, but you have to accompany that with the appropriate counseling and engagement of the individuals. And that takes money, and it's going to take federal resources, real resources from the federal government. And so that was passed. Some of those monies were passed, but we can't let those get taken away in this upcoming budget process. Um, and then the other part of this that we need to do, so there's prevention, treatment, and then there's the acute situation, which is preventing lives lost. And, you know, I think everyone here knows, you know, you need the naloxone. You, you need the drug, and we need to have that accessible to the people who are beside the people where this is happening. And so that needs to be accessible, affordable, so that we can save lives. Um, because that's the other thing. And then at the same time we're doing all of that, we've got to watch the heroin issue because the substitution effect of these things. So, you know, when I've talked to the addicts, met a young woman who was 27 and she told me, oh, after the first year, heroin was easier to get and cheaper to get. And we can't let that be the situation. And that also relates to law enforcement. And law enforcement right now are our stopgap for health care. Our poor law enforcement officials, and that was a meeting many of you may have attended uh, in terms of with President Obama. So those are some of the specifics. It's going to require that anchor of our parenting and our community supporting our children. But we need those other specific elements. And it needs to be a priority. And you know that is one thing I will say for the current administration, uh, you know, have, have articulated that it is a priority now, put the things against it that indicate that it is a priority. Much better answer than mine. <laughs> As you're talking about the priority of working together, do you also see the hindrance of um, what HIPAA puts in to sharing of information and stuff. We're talking about how the drug epidemic has become such an issue. Well, as a medical provider also, when you have patients that aren't legit with you and you have no access to see that they went to two or three different ERs in the last several days, um, because you can't get that information because the patient didn't share it with you. So they got a drug here and then they got another drug and if, hopefully it's on our database. But before the database, a lot of these people were already hooked because they went from one point to the other to the other. And I wanna put that to children's healthcare because we're talking about um, controlling cost. Well, when we don't have the electronic or the databases, of immunization records. So there's not a shared area where you can get a child's immunization record if it's on the system. It's very spotty at times. 
But then we're giving kids six, seven of the same immunization they don't need, talking 200 to $250 a shot. We're talking how that cost is. Sharing of lab information, they go from one hospital and 48 hours later they're in another place, but they don't share. Uh, well child exams, you know, and we're talking the foster system. These kids are from point A to point B to point B, you know, and you know, our Medicaid system says every time they come in for that 24 hour exam, do a well child, do a well child, do a well child, because we don't have access. When was the last one done? And being in rural areas, i.e. Pocahontas County, a lot of the time, you know, access to internet capability. So we can use systems and download and share it with insurance companies or whatever. That's a hindrance, and that's a big money, you know, gap right there that we are losing. So um, let's start with the, the prescription drug part of this and the PDPs, the prescription drug records. Those records now exist and should be used. And this gets to the prescribing that I was saying. So the PDPs exist. They exist better in some states and less well in other states. We need ours right now. I would suggest that we need a compact with Kentucky and Ohio. <laughs> and I will be honest and say we need a compact with Florida and the state of West Virginia because I have a cousin who's a pharmacist in terms of the scripts she's getting. You know, so the, this I think is about getting people to use it. And if it's not working, say what's not working about the PDP. We can't, the lying part, you know, it gets entered in if you if you do the script. You've got to enter it in. So it's about the use of that. So the PD, that I think is a very important part of the sharing of information. And we need to make sure that our pharmacies are using it and our practicing physicians are using it. And the other thing is, again, this is where people should not have pressure because I've heard of cases where if you use it and you question another physician, you know, how, what happens then? And we just have to have a culture change that it's okay for you to say, it looks like you've had this drug from other people, I'm not going to prescribe. Or for a pharmacist to question people who are over prescribing. And so we need to use that tool. That is a tool that exists. It is imperfect and needs to be improved, but it is better. On the electronic health records, I'm going to let the good senator handle the question of broadband because he spent lots of time on those issues and is much better served to do that. That is why, in my remarks, I said one of the three most important changes we can do is making sure electronic health, this data and information gets used. So electronic health records, the basics of this are, in most places, it's recorded. Physicians don't like it because it takes their time away from the patient, and it's hard to do. And part of why it's hard to do is it's not standardized. Um, Actually, your example is perfect. I'm a mom of a nine and a seven year old and I have moved to three different states in the last eight years. Do you know what it's like for me to get the kid enrolled in school because the records don't transfer? So the immunization records, every time. I mean, it is a full day's effort to actually get my kid, get the record so you can enroll the child. So I'm with you, and HHS, all of HHS will tell you, that's the one I'm like, can't we figure that out? It seems simple. But part of it is, and we're working, and that's why we had the roadmap, the interoperability roadmap. That was one of the last things we tried to do before we left, because the systems don't talk, and the software providers that sell the systems to healthcare uh, providers and hospitals don't necessarily want to be a part of making that happen quickly. And so we're caught between the government regulating it and the market doing it. And we chose a path which was that the government would not fully regulate it and say, you have to do it this way. So now we are using steps to encourage the market to move more quickly. But parts of the market have that interest and parts of the market don't. So you're, yes, it is a huge priority. I hope my successor cre considers it as much a priority as I did. Because my next step was take one issue, take one area, take immunization, take something and make it work so that we can show how it can work. I don't think I can add anything to that. Uh, the broadband issue is, is uh, one which really makes my face turn red. Um, I'm not picking on any particular company here, but 
if you follow Verizon's ads on television, you will notice that they've gotten more skillful in covering up West Virginia. But there was always this sort of white space which happened to correspond just exactly with West Virginia, which they were not serving. Now, of course, they do. But on the other hand, I can remember, Sylvia, or Madam President, I should say, uh, you called me senator, then I'm going to call you president, that, that um, 29 miners died in southern West Virginia a number of years ago. And I remember being there. It was just catastrophic. It was awful, 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 awful. And um, being there and watching the Verizon trucks roaring as fast as they could with poles and all kinds of things to try to get that part of the place connected because nobody could nobody could call nobody could make a phone call and that's that's the problem of the profit and loss question of you you usually lose money on rural areas and you you make it up on other areas west virginia has been on the losing side of that too often time for one more question here and then uh, just to give us a little bit of a sense of what comes next thanks to both of our keynote speakers i think uh, we could probably proceed with these types of questions for the two of you all afternoon. People seem to be really enjoying your time, but we'll let people eat lunch. I know that's also a priority for folks. So we're going to have a last question. We're going to turn it over to our two keynotes to answer that, and then we have one other announcement from Senator Rockefeller, and we'll move on to lunch after that. Okay? Uh, Gordon Smith, a new faculty at the School of Public Health. I was just wanting to say I was so pleased to see the uh, opioid issue come up because uh, I keep hearing these horrible stories of these children uh, who are in foster care because both their parents have died or are locked up in prison. And I also, uh, it's such a tied up with the whole health insurance issue, which is really the key of this. We're not only talking of the CHIP program, but it's the Medicaid program so that we can get the parents into treatment and to stop them dying. And uh, so I think that's a really big issue, but I also wanted to take this advantage with a little self-advertising. Uh, we've just been awarded a, a big grant from NIDA to, do, to try and address this issue in a small way down in the eight southernmost counties in the state. And uh, we hope to see this as a leverage and as a model for our health program to deal with that. And so uh, I, the, the counties are McDowell, Mingo, Wyoming, Raleigh, Logan, Boone, Mercer, and Kanawha. But I must say, as a newcomer here, and I've never even been down there yet, I must confess, and we've got this new grant, so one of the new things I'd like to ask Senator Rockefeller is how you come in as a newcomer uh, with a funny accent. I even have a funnier accent because it comes from New Zealand. And how do you get acceptance and, and, and some advice you might have as we start to do something like this? Your soul and your heart have to be in the right place. Um, I. I actually don't think I have any accent, but that didn't help me when I got to West Virginia because <laughs> I had so, so many other uh, really bad qualities. And, uh, but, you know, I, I went to that community. I, I needed them to respond to me. They gradually understood that responding to me might be useful, but on a very slow basis. But it was, it was my need to find a way to do good in my life at that point. And the people of Emmons influenced every vote I ever took in the Senate. I would just um, add, you could add Summers County and you already have a group of people right here who will help. That would be one thing, joking. Um, but I would just say, I think, uh, and my mother is from Mingo County, and my family is still there, so I uh, spent lots of time down there. And I, I guess I would just say, um, I think it is about authentic listening and respect. That that is probably the most important thing in you know, coming from, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people that you're talking about in terms of what, but I also having gone to other places and other cultures and other times. And I do think it's just authentic listening and respect and true respect. And I think, you know, that those two issues actually bring us back to how people work together across the aisle. That that builds the trust and the relationship that then allows you 
to work together to get things done. It's called soft eyes. You have to have soft eyes because you're listening and you're learning and you're being privileged by people talking to you about their lives.